Okay, hello and welcome to our weekly Wednesday night live stream. I am your host, Dana Morningstar, and this is a live stream that I try to do every Wednesday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and I'm a little early tonight. Uh, anyways, so welcome. If you're new here, welcome. If you're returning here, welcome. Let's see, Blue Moon is here, Ran Lion is here, Amber is here, UNA, Kamami. Welcome, welcome. How is everybody doing? I apologize, Angie and I didn't go live yesterday. Uh, she had some last minute stuff that came up. So, and also I just wanted to let you guys know, um, I'm, well, as you, as you already know, I'm terrible <laughs> with doing uh, like marketing and letting people like promotion stuff, but uh, this, these live streams are turned into a podcast and we've been putting, you know, um, older episodes and everything up. So if you're interested in, in that, you can find us at like a, what is it? iTunes and um, Stitcher and all places where podcasts live. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Well, thank you, Metamorphosis. I appreciate that. It says, um, hi, Dana, you and Angie have been lifesavers. I don't chat much, but I do listen. Good deal. I'm glad, I'm glad that these chats help and help. Yeah. UNA says she's getting stuff done. Woohoo. Yes, woohoo for that. Uh-oh, what just happened? Hmm, can you guys still hear me or see me? Oh, shoot. I don't know if I'm still here or not. I'm getting a weird error message. Garrett is saying, okay, everything's okay on his end. Huh, I have an error message that says an error occurred. Please try again later. Playback ID number, yada, 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 yada. Hmm. That is a very scary message warning. I'm going to click on it. I don't know if that's a good idea. Huh. Okay. Okay, metamorphosis is saying, yeah, there's some sort of delay. Anju says, um, I'm grateful for you and Angie. We need to keep the focus on ourselves in order to grow. Yes, absolutely. That is so key in and healing from all of this and not only just healing, but in kind of the next chapter, like rebuilding your life and building it into something, a life that you love. Right. Anju says, yeah, the narcissist won't change, but we will. Yes. And it's really powerful when we get to a place where we're highly motivated um, or kind of forced almost really to look at our lives and figure out what's working and what's not working and um, rebuilding. There's just so much power in rebuilding our lives into something that we love. And it's, it's an incredible amount of work. And I know it can, it's very overwhelming. Um, and most people, don't ever do it because it requires so much work and it's overwhelming. And so most people tend to just kind of live lives. It's the whole like living a life of quiet desperation type thing. And they just kind of go through life and their life 
is uncomfortable for them, but they don't do much to change it because changing it would require too much. And, um, you know, so it's these times where our life is blown apart that we're actually forced to stop and rebuild that is so powerful. See, Anju says, I'm a love addict. I love the attention and the love bombing stage. I can admit that. I think there's a lot of survivors of abuse, um, childhood abuse and adult relationship type abuse that also absolutely love the attention and affection that goes along with the love bombing stage. And for many, it tends to kind of stem from this anxious attachment style or possibly even avoidant attachment style, but more so I think the anxious attachment style where it's uh, this feeling of, you know, needing that constant reassurance that this other person's going to be there, that, th that they uh, really do care. And so instead of seeing the love bombing and the moving too quick as red flags, we gobble it up and we take it as sincerity. Like, oh, this is so wonderful. Finally, I've found this amazing person or this amazing relationship and things just create this whirlwind. Um, and, and that can really be a problem as we've all experienced. So avoidant, the avoidant types can also get caught up in the love bombing because it's, it's a type of intimacy you know, there's that sexual intimacy or maybe even that level of emotional intimacy as far as sharing goes, but with, with a problematic person, with a manipulative or abusive person, it's, it's not sincere. So it feels like real intimacy, but it's not, it's all very uh, manufactured. Anju is saying, yes, that's totally me. I have an insecure attachment style. Yes. And here's the thing too, with attachment styles is they can, and they do change over our lifespan. So it was previous, previously thought that they were relatively set by a fairly young age, by about age three. And research has come to show, no, it's basically they're continually being shaped by the significant relationships a person has throughout their lifespan. So a person can have a, a secure attachment style at one point in their life, then goes through something incredibly traumatic. And then that attachment style shifts to become more insecure, possibly avoidant or, um, or anxious. But the good news is, well, and here's the thing. So the current uh, what would be the phrase for this current like vocabulary, I guess, surrounding attachment styles is it's basically secure, anxious, avoidant, or a hybrid anxious avoidant. And then there's the attachment style of earned secure, which is a person who uh, kind of loops around and then is able through hard work is able to become secure. Personally, I feel like there's an additional type of attachment style, and I just refer to it as the mature style, uh, which is uh, a lot of the elements that are found in secure, but it's coming from a place of um, maturity. There's like a healthy degree of skepticism. It's moving slow. It's, it's not this level of kind of naivete of thinking, oh, I'm just going to... Um, kind of always assume the best kind of Pollyanna principle type stuff. I'm always going to assume the best. I'm just going to assume that the world has my back, all of that. Um, I just, I don't think that's healthy. And so I don't like to refer, I, th I think it causes confusion and it makes, and it kind of adds to a lot of the shame that uh, many survivors of abuse have because then they get upset because they can't convince themselves to to get to that secure attachment place um, 
or earned secure. But like I said, I don't think it's, I think that's out of balance too. So um, I don't know. I like, uh, I'm biased, but I like my mature <laughs> attachment style theory the best. Anyways, so uh, yes. Um, let's see. Blue Moon says, I also think that love bombing can feel so good because it's a form of attention you didn't get as a child. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's a lot of it. So you know, if you think about if a person's been walking around for a long period of time, feeling unloved and unimportant or invisible, pretty much, and you have somebody that comes along and they're so quick to just lavish you with attention and affection, and they seem to see everything that's good and right about you, it feels wonderful. It feels wonderful. And it is wonderful. And it is important that we're able to develop those connections in a healthy way with, with other people. But in, and it can be absolutely devastating if we're getting all of this, this love bombing, uh, in these kind of, uh, what would you call them? Like, uh, positive reinforcement or kind of positive strokes from, from a hurtful person. And this is one of the reasons why these relationships can just be absolutely so devastating and and people end up ending their lives over it because it, it just it it's the worst form of manipulation um yeah gina says you know for me now when a man gives me attention i don't trust it i'm super suspicious and you know, and I think that's okay. It's, it's just about going slow. I mean, the reality is we don't know other, other people's intentions. And especially with online dating, the, the pool of problematic or predatory people is high. And the level of deceit is high with online dating. And yeah, I think even dating in general, I mean, it's just, it's not what it was five, 10, 20 years ago. So moving forward with a healthy degree of skepticism, um, you know, but also just realizing, like, just kind of staying neutral. Like, I don't know. I don't know this person. They might be good. They might be bad, but I don't have anything solid right now on which to, to make a decision from. So I'm just going to keep moving slowly and I, I will see how they respond and how they react in different situations. And then I'll go from there. You know, how are they how do they respect your boundaries? How, what kind of communication do they have? Um, are they willing to work as a team? Um, you know, what are, what are the kinds of things that they're saying? How are they talking about other people in their life? Uh, how do they treat other people? You know, these kinds of things can show you a lot. And, and that's how we build trust. We build trust based off of appropriate behavior, um, not niceness because anybody can be nice. And some of the most dangerous people are the ones that come across as nice. So you're not crazy for having a hard time or you're not like deeply damaged for having a hard time trusting people because you know what's out there. You know that hurtful people can come across as, as really nice. So, um, let's see, Gareth. Oh, I like that. He says, Jordan Peterson says you get 50% of your sanity from other people. Think about this for a moment. It's crucial you surround yourself with the right people. I love that. I agree completely. I agree completely. There's, there's a term out there called co-regulation. And we see this, um, probably the, maybe one of the better examples I can give is, um, if you guys have ever seen the show, The Dog Whisperer, and he had this whole pack of dogs that he's worked with extensively, and they're all, uh, they all have regulated behavior. So they all know how to go for walks. They all know how to, to behave. They're, they work together well as a pack. And when he has a, a dysregulated dog that has been abused or neglected or hasn't been trained whatsoever he uses he brings this dog in 
to the pack that's already been regulated as a way of helping shape and form the dysregulated dog's behavior. And it's so incredibly helpful for that. So people work very much the same way. So we, we do take these cues from other people, just like any other animal does about what's appropriate behavior and what's inappropriate behavior. And it's significantly easier when we're around a bunch of other people that have this level of emotional regulation uh, that we're able to be emotionally regulated. And even, um, even if we're not dysregulated, okay, so let's say we've, we've processed a lot of the trauma, we've processed a lot of our feelings. When you're around, I mean, I, we can, we've all experienced this, I'm sure, right? No matter, uh, actually, let me back up. Eckhart Tolle jokes about this. He's the guy that wrote The Power of Now. And he says, you know, if you, like, if you think you're so enlightened, uh, basically go visit your parents for a weekend. And I thought that was so spot on because it's so, it, it's, uh, it's easy for us to kind of think, okay, I've got, I've got a lot of these skills down. I'm feeling emotionally regulated. I, you know, I'm doing good. And then when we get put in an environment where there's these old patterns, a lot of them are disempowering or dysfunctional patterns of interacting with others, we can easily slip back into that, into that, that level of dysfunction. And and then we become dysregulated because, and then it's even more so because we're like, we're not, this isn't how I interact with people anymore. This isn't, and it's, it can be really jarring to be kind of thrust back into uh, that level of chaos again. So yes, choose your company well. And you know, there's also another saying out there that says, you know, before you diagnose yourself with anxiety or depression, look around and see who you're spending time with. And that's, it's very significant. I would say the vast majority of the time, unless it's some sort of chemical imbalance, um, it has a lot to do with environment. And we get so used to suppressing these, this level of discomfort, thinking, oh, well, um, you know, I, I've, I've got to, I've got to be friends with this person. I've known him since third grade, or I've got to work at this job because I get paid pretty decent, or I like the hours, or I've been here too long to get an arm too old or whatever it might be to get a different job. And so we suppress all of the discomfort and it's, it's like, it's like stepping on a nail and just learning to walk with it in your foot. And then wondering why your foot continues to ache. And trying to convince yourself that it doesn't. I mean, it's it's a lot, and we do we all tend to do that to some degree. So, being aware of if you're doing that, and and to stop. Oh, uh, let's see. Gina is saying, you know, to me, anything that makes me feel uncomfortable, I'd consider abusive. Okay. Okay. Here's the first part of her question. Dana, sometimes I wonder if I'm now I'm overly sensitive. I just stopped talking to a great guy because I didn't like one or two things about him. How do we find the balance? Oh, this is such a great question. And then she adds to me, anything that makes me feel uncomfortable, I consider abusive. Okay. Hold on. I have to cough. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so there's when two people are being authentic, there's going to be differences that surface. Um, there's going to be differences between how to spend money or how much time to spend with friends or what to do, what kind of food to eat when you go out for dinner or um, how he likes to dress or how you like to dress. There's, there's going to be differences there because you're two different people. And, and so that's, that's normal that there's going to be disagreements. There's going to be uh, kind of that, that clashing, I guess. It's how that those differences are handled that make all of the difference. So it depends on the, the things that you didn't like about him. If it's, 
and I guess that would fall into the things that you didn't like about him. Could this, were these things that were kind of core to his person, kind of unchangeable things that maybe wouldn't be fair um, to ask, or are they character, like concerning kind of character things that you're like, ooh, yikes, that's deal breaker stuff. Or are they things that could be addressed and resolved with effective communication? So kind of looking at it that way of kind of where along the spectrum does it, it takes time. It takes time and practice. Um, you know, I've referred to it before as kind of getting your sea legs. So when, when we've been going through life kind of with this, this worldview, whatever our worldview might be, we get in, I think for most of us, it's kind of, we just tend to assume like overly optimistic. We tend to assume the best. We, um, you know, are, are assuming other people are honest and are faithful and loyal and, uh, you know, have the same morals and values as us. And then if you get into uh, an exploitative relationship, um, it just, it knocks the wind out of your sails big time. And so then it's trying to kind of just reorient yourself to like, okay, well, how do I stay safe in this world? I don't under, I don't understand this world. So it's developing a new map of the way things are. And that takes time and it takes practice. So it's very, very, very common. I would say close to hundred percent of people that experience something like this, um, a relation, like a really traumatic relationship tend to go on the opposite to the opposite end of the spectrum. And they're very hypervigilant. They're very distrusting. They, um, there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of fear of, well, uh, is it, is it me or is it the other person? Like, where is this issue and what's a deal breaker and, and what's not, and am I being unreasonable and, um, kind of what's going on here. So really, I think at the end of the day, you can kind of look at it in terms of, uh, well, okay. You can look at it in terms of, are they, um, you know, are they concerned about your well-being? Is there a level of respect that's always present, especially when there's disagreements? And is effective communication present? So if effective communication is present, then issues can be of any size, uh, can be addressed and, and resolved. And if they can't, then that, those are valid reasons for moving on. Um, a person that's not concerned about, they don't see a problem with, with, uh, you know, being rude or disrespectful or, um, kind of treating you with disdain, contempt, or hostility when there's disagreements, they're immature, they do silent treatment, they fly into a rage, this kind of st stuff. If, if you are able to bring stuff up to them. These are the concerns. Like they give you, they get upset. They give you the silent treatment. And if you were to say, you know what? I understand that you're upset. Uh, but however, I don't, I just, I don't do the silent treatment. So it's okay for you to be upset. However, if you're not going to speak to me, if you're so upset that you can't have a conversation, that's fine. Just let me know when you do plan on opening up again. And it really needs to be within a reasonable amount of time. I would say within 72 hours for sure. So anything more than that, then that's ridiculous. It's one thing not wanting to talk to another person. It's one thing if it's coming from a place of I need to calm down and gather my thoughts. And so I don't say things I, I regret versus I'm not talking to you as a form of punishment. If you start finding or feeling like, you're the bad guy in the relationship, um, then, then that's a problem. You know, if there's that level of contempt, disdain, hostility, that's a problem. So, and it, it just, it takes, um, you know, it takes time. And here's the thing too, with, with dating again, uh, there's probably going to be at least one or two things that you don't like about the other person. 
it's it's what those one or two things are or three or four or four or five it's what those things are and how big of a deal they are is this stuff is this something that's workable or or not and do these these issues fall into you know is it is it about character is it about commitment is it about uh, compatibility is it where do these issues fall Uh, let's see here. Oh, I also wanted to touch on the second part of what you were saying that to you, anything that makes you feel uncomfortable, you consider abusive. So This can be, this can be a problem because nobody else knows where, what makes a person comfortable or uncomfortable. So when we experience discomfort, it's more often than not, it's a sign of a boundary violation, but keep in mind that not all boundary violations are intentional or malicious. They happen and they're going to happen between well-intended people. It's, it's how that boundary violation is handled that that makes the difference. So let's say, for example, um, you know, you're out with, I don't know, you're, you're out with somebody and it's making you uncomfortable with how, um, how close they're standing or what have you. And they don't see a problem with it, um, but you're not comfortable with it it's okay for you to not be comfortable with it. And it's okay for you to, to kind of say something, to say something about it. Um, it doesn't mean that they're, uh, just because you're uncomfortable that they're abusing you. But if, if you say, if you assert a boundary, let's maybe let's use a better example that I think more people tend to encounter. Somebody's kind of being pushy. Uh, you're, you're starting to date them or you're starting to message back and forth. They start kind of being a little bit pushy. They start being a little overly flirty, uh, these kinds of things. And you're like, mm, yeah, that's not what I'm looking for. Like, not, a, not don't really want to be talked to like that, or no, I don't think so. And if that's not an instant deal breaker for you, um, which it's fine if it is, okay? But if it's not, and you're like, well, maybe I'm just gonna give this person the benefit of the doubt and I'm just gonna kind of set them straight, but then they keep on. Oh, I was just joking. Or uh, I just wanted to see what you would say to that. Or, you know, this, that, or the other. And they just kind of keep pushing this boundary. Then it's disrespectful. And that, uh, yeah, I mean- it's within, it's within that zip code of problematic behavior, for sure. It's, it shows disrespect. So th this is why it's important to kind of, you know, to assert ourselves and say like, this is, this isn't okay with me and to be okay with that because everything, everybody's different. So what's okay with you and what's not okay with you is going to vary from person to person, male or female. Uh, it, where your boundaries are is where your boundaries are. Okay. Let's see. Let me scroll down. Yeah, Lisa says, oh, I was just testing you. Yeah, stuff like that. It's games. You know, it's games and if it, I, I, kind of either it needs to be effective communication or bust, you know, if I'm not trying to play games, I'm not trying to second guess who I'm with. I'm not trying to, uh, to do all this, like, no, it's exhausting. So, you know, you need for effective communication to happen, both people need to be accountable for their behavior and to have that open, honest, sincere, solutions-oriented communication. 
And it, that can be difficult at times, because like I said, we're all going to cross a line with another person in some way, shape or form, generally more on the mild end, you know, um, everybody has their idea of kind of what's appropriate. Some people, uh, you know, they don't like being called after 9 PM. Other people don't have a problem with it. Some people have no problem. Somebody saying, Hey, let's go out for dinner tonight in, in an hour. Other people are kind of offended by that. And there is no right or wrong. It's just differences. And so it's okay to just speak up and to say what's not working for you. Um, oh, <laughs> thank you. Gina says, you're the relationship whisperer. Thank you. Oh, that's cute. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, uh, let me scroll up here. Amber says, you know, I don't know that I ever learned healthy interpersonal communication. I don't think most people do. And no wonder. <laughs> that we're in the situation that we're in because it's these are important life skills I mean can you imagine not teaching a person the kind of the basics of social interaction of, co of course they're going to go way off track and get caught up in all kinds of stuff because they don't they don't know different all all they know is based off of what they were raised with or who they were around or what they saw on TV or uh, on YouTube or on, you know, in music. And the vast majority of that stuff is absolute garbage. And it teaches people like, basically how to be dysfunctional, deeply dysfunctional. So yeah, I'd say most people don't know how to have healthy interpersonal communication. It's a game changer when we can start learning these skills. And that's, I guess, the good news too, is these are skills. They're absolutely learnable. Um, it's just like having table manners or anything else. You know, I, it's just, I, I don't think that it requires, actually, you know, it doesn't require years or even months of therapy. I'd say a few classes, uh, just kind of quote unquote, psychoeducational classes where you're just, these skills are just laid out and and addressed it creates i just have noticed significant profound differences in a person's life when they get a few of these basics figured out it, it's not it's not this huge um it doesn't need to be this huge mystery you know but unfortunately the way it, it is right now it it is <sighs> Okay, let's see that. Let me scroll up here. Um, Anju says, it's very easy as codependents to talk about the abuser or the narcissist. The more we focus on ourselves. Uh, I never used to cry. Now I feel my feelings. Yes. The more you hide your feelings, the more pain you hold. Yes. And so part of this is, is because all of us, as we go through life, we are our own baseline for normal. So when we're going, and you see this with narcissists and abusive people as well, they are their own level of normal. So this is why they get so offended when, um, their worldview uh, doesn't match up with reality because it's their roadmap to the way things should be. So for us, it's the same. So when somebody mistreats us, it's, we're like, well, I don't have the problem. I'm not the one who flew into a rage and, you know, tried to, uh, you know, th threaten to kill my partner or, 
is a maniac when I get upset or does all of this. Like, I don't have the problem. I'm on the receiving end of this person's problematic behavior. And it can, and it's very difficult for a person to understand how could there be any other interpretation of what happened? Like this person is completely uh, unhinged, you know, and dangerous and deep, deeply disturbed. And all of that might very well be true. But because this stuff's not taught and it's not, it's, when it is presented to us, it can feel very invalidating and very re-victimizing. Um, and it can feel like we're, people are saying, oh, well, you're, you're somehow saying I, I deserved this or I caused it. And that's not the case at all. Nobody ever deserves to be abused. Um, but it's worth examining, okay, what was it about this relationship that, that I was attracted to as to why I wanted to stay in it for so long? Um, is it, I thought that they just would honestly change. I thought that the issue was my communication. Um, and if, even if that is the case, even it kind of goes back to like, okay, well, we're still missing the piece that it's important to have deal breakers. Again, this stuff's not taught. So most people have this idea of, well, I thought commitment was forever. Or some people are in situations where like, you know, my religion doesn't condone divorce. So it was never an option. Or I had children with this person. So it's not like I was staying out of, uh, you know, love or anything. It was, I, I had to. I didn't have the money to leave or we had children together or my religion or culture or whatever it was wouldn't, wouldn't allow it. So sometimes people do get trapped in these relationships, but at the, the end of the day, it's important to kind of take pause, I guess, and examine our, our boundary standards and deal breakers. And even if a person had wonderful balanced boundary standards and deal breakers before this relationship, I guarantee you that there's been damage done in ways that they can't even begin to fathom. And it's still worth examining these things now. Because again, this stuff's not taught. And when you're like Gareth was saying, 50% of your stability, or I guess Jordan Peterson was saying, 50% of your stability comes from those around you. So if you're around a very deeply dysfunctional person, you're going, you're going to pick up a lot of deeply dysfunctional ways of interacting and communicating. And uh, there's going to be stuff there that needs to be untangled and, and worked on. Oh boy, Lisa says my toxic ex-girlfriend from, okay, over a year ago, found out that my mom died. I received a pink roses crown flower heart shaped with rest in peace, all the best. Mm. Well, I right, hold on, let's see. Okay. Also two luxury deceased gift boxes for him and for her. I'm homesick since today they say it's, oh, I'm homesick. They, I want to give her back everything. What do you advise me? I would, no, because then that's, that's just going to reopen things. And that might kind of be what she wants to reopen the door. I would say either just throw it away or uh, donate it to a hospital or yeah, those would be the two things I would do, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't talk. I wouldn't reopen communication with her. I wouldn't say thank you. I wouldn't anything. It's uh, unwanted gifts from a person that you intentionally cut off communication with and that you don't want to have communication with. So nope, I not worth reopening that door. Okay, Gina. 
Let me scroll back up here. Um, says, okay, with this guy, I didn't like his tone towards me. He sounds demeaning and super insecure, almost as he, as if he has lights and deflects. But I'm not sure if it's me. I just had to take a break to think. I, I guess kind of step, if you can try to step out of that and figure out is, is it me or is it him? It, it, in many ways, you don't even need to answer that question. If somebody's behavior is not sitting, sitting well with you, then it's an issue. It's not necessarily like an abusive issue. It's not necessarily anything other than I'm not comfortable with the way this person is coming across. Like, I don't like that. That's it. It's not okay with you. So, um, and more often than not, when a person comes, you know, you know what it sounds like when a person's being demeaning or sounding super insecure. So odds are that he's coming in across in a way that's striking you as being demeaning and him coming across as super insecure. So it's worth addressing and just saying, you know, um, when you made the comment the other night of, um, I don't know, that I was having, that you felt, I, you jokingly said uh, that I was having a blonde moment, right? And uh, I just, I don't like jokes like that. It just, it feels demeaning and it feels condescending. And I just, I don't like jokes like that. So now he might say, you know, and, and he might, oh, try to justify, oh, I was just joking or, um, you know, I didn't mean to come across as demeaning or this is what's important. Pay attention to his response. How does he handle you saying what you said? Uh, I don't, I, I find this to be kind of demeaning or this to be condescending. I, I don't appreciate this, this kind of interaction. And, and if he continues to fight you on it, then there you go. Um, it's this inability, it's an inabil inability to respect your boundaries is, is what it is at that point. Jamie says, why am I still so broken? Even though I know it's dysfunctional and wrong in my head, at the same time, I'm like, someone please abuse me. Tell me more about that, Jamie. Is it really somebody please abuse me or is it um, the quote unquote good parts of an abusive person? Like the excess, oftentimes the, the level of intensity, the excessive communication, the excessive attention, the excessive affection. Okay, Fatima, no problem. No problem. I will be around. I'm glad to see that you're still around too. Uh, Renzo asks, do you believe in Carl Jung psychology and Jordan Peterson psychology to heal from ex-narcissistic abuse? It has really helped me to realize what is important in relationships and the way I live life. I guess it depends on what, what that's, those are, I mean, <laughs> that covers a lot of ground. Are we talking, um, uh, Carl Jung and like the, the, what is it, like the shadow self. Um, and as far as Jordan Peterson psychology, I'm not, I mean, that again, that covers a huge, a huge range of, of things. Both of them, I think are wonderful uh, and have a, a ton of very valid points. 
will, it's a good start, I guess is what I'm saying. I think it's a good start. Will it cover all of the points necessary in order to actually uh, um, heal from narcissistic abuse? I guess it depends on what areas a person needs to work on. Everybody's going to have different experiences and different degrees of trauma and different questions and uh, all that. But I guess my personal take on it is I really feel that the most effective way is it requires more of a roadmap. And that's something that I've been working on for quite a while. Hopefully I'll finish it by the end of this year. Um, but I think there's specific points that a person needs to, to go back to kind of circle around and examine to see if, and, and get these addressed and, and rebalanced in order um, to heal in, I guess, in, at a minimum in terms of how I would consider my definition of healing. Um, and to me, healing is a lot more than just um, no longer feeling suicidal or um, it, it's healing from this really means to be able to be reconnected to ourself and our wants and our needs and our boundaries and standards and deal breakers and our, our feelings in an empowered, effective way, and that we're able to have uh, effective communication with other people, it, it just it just blows the door open to this tremendous amount of personal growth and self-awareness that I just don't think people would really have any other way. Um, but I think there's a lot, a lot to it. Uh, let's see, let me scroll up. Kimberly says, I have to take some responsibility and that I made the choice to keep ignoring the red flags because I wanted to believe it would change and get better. I made the choice to get involved and to stay. Yeah. The challenge with this is it's not so much of a conscious decision and it, it tends to be we're making this decision based off of dysfunctional messages and um, dysfunctional ideas about love and about relationships. There's a lot of misunderstandings that go into play when a person continues to stay in a relationship like this. There's also tends to be a lot of um, um, kind of issues in terms of um, insecure attachment styles that really come into play, especially anxious attachment style. So it, and it can take, it takes some time to get to that place where the, the pain isn't so great um, that we're able to get to that point of examining, well, yeah, why did I stay here for so long? Like what was, what was it about this relationship that had its hooks in me so deep? And what was it about this person? But for most people, that tends to be out of ways. And for somebody to, here, here's where I, I also see a lot of survivors go wrong, um, myself included, is there can also be this, this degree of hyper accountability and things of, um, and that's coming from a place of, uh, kind of their safety and control of thinking, okay, well, if I can kind of quote unquote, own my part in everything, then I have the ability to change it. So bring it on, like make everything like at least 50% my fault, because then I have, then I can do something with this. Uh, a lot of people that are, mm, that can get, well, okay. So like there's 
tends to be kind of two type personality types that get caught up in these relationships. There's more of um, the external locus of control. Events happen to them. Um, they're, they're, they feel powerless. Other people set the pace. Other people kind of lead the show. And then there's people that have an, a, a, an internal locus of control, which is a really important piece of healing. And it's an important part of things, but it's this level that, it can be to a problematic degree where and it creates, it can create this level of hyper accountability of, well, everything is within my control. Um, not to like a, you know, delusional level, but to a point of um, kind of anything that I am, uh, I don't know, anything that I'm a part of, then I, I I have at least, let's say, 80% control over. And the result of that is this, this feeling of, it can cause a lot of guilt. I should have done more. I should have done better. I should have done this. I should have done that. And not realizing that if we're in a relationship or a friendship or whatever it is, it's 50-50. Like it takes, or it's 100-100. It takes two people to, to make things work. And so it's not 100%, excuse me, 100% our fault. Um, but yes, it's worth digging in and kind of figuring out, okay, well, what was it about this relationship that hooked me? Why did I stay for as long as I did? And approaching it from a place of curiosity and compassion and not judgment. Judgment doesn't help. But yeah, okay, what just, yeah, what was it? What was it about this relationship? Um. Yeah, but it's interesting because like I said, survivors can tend to go on either side of that spectrum and it can be very challenging to find more of a middle ground there of if we were a willing participant in something, even though that relationship was incredibly abusive or um, exploitative, then again, coming from a place of curiosity and compassion, um, what, what just, what was, uh, what was our thinking at the time? What was our rationale? Did we just, was it just not even on our radar that, um, you know, that a person could be so malicious, like intentional. I really think a lot of people just have this idea that if their partner, that people in relationships do things, like if they're not happy in a re- in a relationship or with their partner, that's why they act out. If a person cheats, it's because they're not happy with their partner or they're not happy with their relationship. I think there's just a lot of misinformation about behavior. And because that's not always true. Sometimes people cheat because it's just fun or they're bored or, um, you know, they have no moral compass. Like there's lots of different reasons people cheated. Sometimes it has nothing to do with their partner or their relationship. They'll cheat on whoever they're with, you know, or they lie, not just because they're not comfortable with the truth, but they might lie because it's fun. It makes them feel powerful. It makes them, um, you know, you know, who, who knows? So some of the stuff we just, um, can't always take account take accountability for because it's not ours to own yeah sunshine says yes i still blame myself six years after divorce from my relationship and it just doesn't feel good i just should have been a better judge of character yes that's a good example of that level of hyper accountability, which um, misplaced accountability. Let's say that all we can do is all we can do at the time. And when we know different, we can do different manipulative. Everybody thinks that they, that this would never happen to them. Nobody thinks that they'd ever get involved in a cult. Nobody ever thinks they'd get involved in an abusive relationship. And nobody thinks they'd ever get caught up in a scam, you know? And it happens 
to lots and lots of people and lots of, you know, intelligent people from good childhoods. And that can be very confusing and we can be so hard on ourselves. It's, that's the, the kind of the best thing and the worst thing about hindsight is looking back on a thing. When we have all of the facts nicely kind of tied together in a row, it's easy to be like, oh, of course, yes, this all makes sense. Because we're looking at it, it's, you're looking at it when it's, the problem is solved, right? The puzzle is solved versus the individual pieces. And um, it can contribute. And of course, other people too, the outside looking in, they think that they have a lot more insight than they really do. So it's the whole, the whole thing is crazy making and anybody can get caught up in this kind of stuff. It's, um, you know, so I just encourage people because it's not taught. I mean, I just, I just go back to that. You look at how many people got caught and still get caught up with online scam kind of stuff. And when they began, when there became more education out there about this is what scams look like, the, you know, it just wasn't on the radar of normal, decent people that somebody would go to such great links or that would even do that in general. And lots of savvy, intelligent people have gotten caught up in this. So it's, um, you can all, all, it's all any of us can do is do the best we can at the time with the information we have. Uh, let's see here. Oh, metamorphosis is saying Peterson also thinks women are responsible for cheating husbands, that they're accomplices. I get that codependency can cause problems, but no one is responsible for another person being a piece of trash. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's a ridiculous view. And, and this is why a lot of people stay hooked in these relationships is thinking, oh, my spouse is cheating because of something that I did or that I'm not doing. And then the other, the spouse is working. I've, I see this with all kinds of mental health professionals all the time. And it, it just, whoa, like fire just shoots out my ears. Because uh, no, that's, that's not, you're right. Another person, it's not right. And it's not fair to put another person's horrific actions on onto their spouse or onto the other person. Um, there's other ways of handling situations. And more often than not, it's a, it's whenever they do give an excuse, it's just a way for them to ease their guilt. I would say nine out of 10 times, it's not even true. So yeah, so that's, it's, that's ridiculous. And that's, it's offensive. Um, thinking that another person drove another person to, to cheat, to lie, to steal, to, to do whatever. Okay, Jamie. Oh, well, okay. So I guess Jordan Peterson has said some problematic things that I'm not aware of. Yeah, that's disgusting. Megan said, yeah, Jordan Peterson made me feel very depressed. He had a video where he said women should have families and children. Otherwise they will be painfully lonely in older age. And I just disagree so strongly. Yeah, I disagree so strongly with that as well. Uh, first off, I think it's a terrible reason to get married and have kids because you don't want to be alone. I think that's incredibly um, concerning. And it tends to be parents that have, that people that do get married or have kids um, with that mentality tend to cause a lot of damage because they're, they're not respecting this other person as an individual. It's, well, I brought you into my life, so I won't be lonely. Therefore, you can't leave. That doesn't allow the other person to, um, 
you know, to be, to be themselves and to have an, the ability, especially with kids, it's important that kids leave and become an adult and live their adult life and not feel obligated to, to take care of their parents' social needs or needs at all that you've got two adults. There comes a point in a parent child relationship where you have two adults and they're able to, there's that sense of mutuality and support. There's not that level of dependence um, on either side or it's, it's problematic. So the benefit of having relationships with other people is what's important there is the sense of connection. So humans, uh, we do best when we're connected with other humans. One of the most cruel forms of punishment is solitary confinement. And that's why it, it, it can cause severe damage to a person's brain when they're not around other people. Like that's how hardwired we are to be around others. But this doesn't mean that you could, you need to, uh, that you should get married or have children. Uh, there's lots of different ways that we can have um, healthy connection to other people. So I, and like I said before, I would even say trying connecting to others with the sense of, well, I don't want to be lonely. <laughs> That's just going to cause, uh, that's going to cause more problems. And it's going to actually ironically create loneliness because it's going to push a lot of people away because we're not able to give them their autonomy and their space. Because, you know, again, I'm like, oh, okay, you're in my life because I'm lonely. And it's, we're just going to be too needy and clingy. And that's just a huge turnoff. Uh, let's see. Jamie, okay, was saying before she was wanting people to abuse her. She says, well, Dana, it's because when I mess up with normal everyday things that normal people don't freak out about, like a flat tire or broken glass, you know, whatever. The people around me now don't yell and call me an idiot or tell me I'm worthless, but I expect it. So I guess, tell me more about that. So, because when they have, when they have this non-reaction or a more regulated reaction, oh, you got a flat tire. And then they realize, well, oh man, that sucks. Do you need a ride? Or they're not somehow blaming you for getting a flat tire or they're not coming down on you hard. What's what are the, like, how are you internalizing that? What kind of messages are you telling yourself? Are you, um, is, is it, does it, I guess, how does it feel when somebody's handling things in a more mellow way? Okay, let me see. Darling Ebony is saying, you know, Jordan Peterson has also said some very racist things. Incels love him. I thought I was the only one who caught this, so I just kept my mouth shut. Oh, interesting. You know, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, I, I agree. I do think that there's a lot of um, his message can speak to a lot of extreme beliefs. Um, but I think they're twisted and, and I, and there are some things and I haven't, you know, I obviously haven't listened to everything he's put out there. I haven't heard a lot of the concerns people have brought up tonight. Um, you know, so I'd have to, I, I guess I'd have to dig into it. The things I have heard from him, I think have been very, very grounded and even keel. And I like the fact that he is about accountability and, um, you know, I think he has some interesting takes on, on certain things, but, um, 
it's interesting to me. I think he inadvertently became kind of this father figure to generations of really lost men. And which I guess in many ways is a good thing, because like I said, I think more often than not, his thoughts on things are, are good. Um, if he does have some problematic views, I, I almost would guess that if he was challenged with them, that he would take a more moderate approach um, with them. But there's, there's a lot of really angry, confused, um, hurt um, men out there that do tend to, I think, gravitate towards what he's saying. And, and it's like anything else, you know, we all, we all filter information, not based on what the information is, but based on who we are. So if a person has this, this level of, um, um, you know, deep misogyny or, um, you know, probably racist views or, or whatever it might be, they're going to cherry pick. They're going to filter anything. It's confirmation bias. They're going to start filtering information based on that things that are already confirming their existing beliefs. And that's concerning and problematic. I see a lot, I see a lot of that with um, incel and some of the MGTOW stuff where it's, it's, um, you know, supposedly based in science and facts, but it's not, it's based on like cherry picked studies and skewed data and um, all of that. And it just, a lot of it really fosters, um, you know, it fosters hate and, and these kinds of things. Now I'm all for men, just like women who want to kind of go their own way. If women are like, you know what, Hey, um, I don't want to get married. I don't want to have kids more power to you. And if guys are at the same place, more power to you. I think people should be able to create a, a, a life that is empowering for them, whatever that might look like, as long as you're not hurting other people. Um, you know, and to kind of question, like to question societal norms and to see, does this work for me? And is this something that I want to, uh, to take part in? And if not, then that's okay. Then find somebody else, find a partner that if you want to find a partner that feels the same way, you know, what, what gets me is a lot of the, um, you know, like we talked about before, kind of with a lot of the MGTOW stuff, it's, it's not about men going their own way. It's about men that are really hyper-focused on how awful women are. I would be all for these groups significantly more if it truly was about men going their own way, talking about, hey, man, these are the books I'm reading. This is where I'm going to travel to. This is what business I'm starting. Like, this is what I'm doing on my path of going my own way. But they're not going their own way. They're hyper-focused on uh, how awful and hateful and mean and cruel women are. And, in, and there isn't that level of accountability where they're able to look at themselves and be like, okay, well, uh, let's examine why I'm attracted to this kind of person or this kind of woman. And because it's hard to, right? It's hard to, but they've created this whole added, this whole belief system that, well, no, no, it's, it's not that, that they could possibly just be attracted to, to, really hurtful or horrible women it's that all women are like this so it doesn't matter who they're attracted to because all women are are you know um i don't know <laughs> like the gold digging uh you know um you know just awful creatures that are out to seek and consume and destroy a man and that's not the case So, okay. Let me. Let's see here. I'll have to, to go dig up some Jordan Peterson videos and, and go go through a lot of this. Gareth is saying, he's like, I'm stunned by some of the things he said. He's like, on the other hand, much can be learned from him. I agree. That's been my experience. The, the, 
vast majority of his work, I think is incredibly insightful. I, I appreciate how passionate he is. And I do think that he truly cares about people and, um, wants them to live their best life. And, um, yeah, I would be curious to kind of explore some of these more problematic things that he has potentially said and, and see what that's about. Cause that's just, that's surprising to me. Okay, Alicia, and I still need to email you back. I apologize. Has said, Dana, is there a way I can work towards sort of desensitizing myself so that I don't get upset, anxious, or panicky and struggle to regain emotional regulation when or after I see him? I guess, are you, do you have like advanced notice of when you're going to see him? I think you'd mentioned that you you work in the same place, right? So you, you kind of potentially run into him at, with at meetings or um, kind of a, a work environment. If that's the case, there's there's a couple different things that you can do. Um, You can, and I, and then, you know, different people are going to do better with different strategies. Uh, I'll just tell you from my personal experience, one of the things that's helped a lot is to, to use visualization. So visualizing a, um, like a, a beautiful healing waterfall that is over this, a doorway. And so as you're walking through it, visualizing it's just rinsing off all of the, your stress and anxiety as you're going in to this meeting and you might even decide to get up during the meeting or whatever it is and then go excuse yourself to the bathroom or whatnot and go walk through that doorway again just to kind of visualize okay washing away all of the stress and anxiety giving yourself time to kind of wash your hands, just breathe, collect yourself, go back in, visualize walking through that door, that waterfall again. Um, you can, that can help uh, visualizing a bubble around you, um, like a giant hamster ball <laughs> of, of white light where you're in the bubble and, um, and you can really, play a lot with these visualizations, uh, the, you know, where, uh, you invite the energy and the people that you want into the bubble and you get rid of what you don't want. You could pretend when he's talking that it sounds like the, who was it? The teacher on the old peanuts cartoon, the want, want, want sound, or as though he's underwater and it's just kind of this muffled sound because your bubble is, protecting you. You can visualize him. If you've ever seen the movie Weird Science, I don't know how old you are, but um, although I think you did tell me, I don't remember. I think you're, you're younger than I am. Um, great movie, by the way, 80s movie, Weird Science, where they turn this jerk face brother into like this slug, <laughs> like Jabba the Hutt, like gross looking creature. And he's just foul, like he's burping and farting. And he's just, he's, he's as gross on the outside as he is on the inside is what it is. And um, so visualizing him that way to where you're almost kind of giggling. So those, those are some things that, that can kind of help. Uh, it takes away the, the power of his presence when you're, when you're changing, I guess, how you perceive him. Okay. She's like, yeah, I'm thinking about visualizing him like the teacher on Charlie Brown. The mwah, 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 mwah. Yeah, I like that. Let me know how that works. I'll be curious. Uh... Mm-hmm. I like that. 
Kevin, I agree, says a very powerful tool for healing is listening to, to ambient sounds like rainfall or fireplaces. Yes. There is a YouTube channel. Uh, I, this, I absolutely just love this channel and this guy. He's just so neat in so many ways. Uh, it's called Primitive Technology. And he, there's no talking. And it's just this, this guy. And I, I want to say he's in like Australia or New Zealand or someplace. And he builds the most amazing things out in the middle of nowhere randomly and it's just with his surroundings so he might build a hut or he might build he did one where he built a kiln and he fired uh he found clay and made roof tiles for his hut uh he he just does all these little projects and it's so relaxing because all you hear are the sounds of nature and it's just this guy out in the middle of nowhere just being being a creative human and it's so peaceful. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you hundred percent on that. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. Thank you for elaborating. Renzo um, says, thank you for responding to my question. If you would like, I wrote down what specifically helped me get through my ex narcissistic abuse following Young and Peterson psychology. For Young, it was separate from your ego. Um, do shadow work and come to terms with your anime and animus, the masculine and feminine energy. For Peterson, it was clean your room, organize your life and create a moral philosophy, confront the dragon of chaos, bring the, con the unconscious to consciousness and work through as much trauma as you can. Uh, the rescue your father from the belly of the whale, which basically is confront things that scare you daily so that you can reach your match maximum potential. I've been working on this in one way or another for the past two years, and I feel a lot more hopeful and connected to myself and others. Uh, thank you so much for all that you do, Dana. Oh, I also sent a donation on Super Chat. Thank you again. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I, and I agree. I think all of these lessons, um, I guess when I think about Jordan Peterson, like these are the lessons that I think about as well. So, and these are all wonderful lessons that um, confronting things that scare you so you can reach your max maximum potential, stepping outside of your comfort zone in in a reasonable and healthy way, right, uh, is it's game changing. There's a saying out there that says your life begins at the end of your comfort zone. And that's powerful. That's powerful. I love, I love that quote. So getting curious and maybe a, a good way to start this is to get curious about why certain things cause you discomfort. It's very telling, you know, we spend, again, this stuff's not taught. So we all spend a large, many decades, a large portion of our time running away from what's uncomfortable, especially when it involves emotions and thinking that that's what we're supposed to do because who wants to sit around and feel uncomfortable emotions, right? But the benefit to uncomfortable emotions and notice that I'm saying uncomfortable, I'm not saying bad. This is another shift that can be helpful because when we think of emotions as bad or good, we're already off the path a little bit because emotions aren't bad or good. They're just, they're neutral. They just are, but they all have messages for us. And so these, what we consider bad emotions, anger, envy, jealousy, rage, sadness, depression, anxiety, whatever it might be 
these aren't bad, they're uncomfortable, but they have a message for us. And it's letting us know that, hey, there's some, there's something that needs to be addressed here, tends to be the common denominator between all of those uncomfortable emotions. Comfortable emotions are ones that we equate with being good, joy, happiness, bliss, um, contentment, peace, um, uh, feeling nourished, um, excitement, um, feeling motivation, these kinds of things that we associate with good, those also have a message. And that message tends to be, um, if our compass is working correctly, that you're on track. This is what's nourishing for you. This is, this is what is working for you. Do more of this. And the uncomfortable emotions, we tend to, to blur this and assume or think um, that this means do less of this. And in some ways it, it can mean that, you know, if we touch a hot stove or we're around a, a really hateful or hurtful person, that the message is do less of this. But it's also worth exploring uh, why that discomfort is there. Not saying that their behavior is somehow appropriate or workable, but when we're coming from um, the, the degree of reaction we have to especially um, circumstances or, or other people, when it's extreme, it tends to be a sign, hey, there's some unresolved stuff here. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing that we're able to be aware of that. When these emotions, when these uh, various traumas within ourselves have been effectively resolved, there's a level of emotional neutrality there where we're not internalizing it. So we might come across somebody who's a racist or sexist or, or whatever, and we might be annoyed. You know, we're like, oh, well, you know, I, get me out of here kind of a thing it registers as this isn't something that I want to be a part of, but it doesn't bring out rage in us. It's because we're in it. We don't take it personally. We don't need to feel, we don't need to go on the attack. We get annoyed. We get frustrated. We have these feelings of, um, we can see the injustice for what it is. And we can maybe even want to be motivated to do something about it, you know, but we're able to do so from a place of, um, um, we're able to channel those feelings of anger or rage in into like a positive way because we're not taking it, uh, we're not taking it so personally. We realize this is that this person has an issue, and although they might hate minorities, they might hate women, whatever, they don't know me. They just hate and their hate, um, and that's sad for them, um, but their hate is, is their hate. I can maybe work to, you know, kind of for, for equality or, or what have you, but, um, you know, that's their issue. Like it's, it's not a reflection of me and my worth, I guess is what I'm saying. Like they can be racist and sexist, but I don't need to let that negatively impact me and, and take it on as my own. Be like, oh, well, there must be something wrong with me because I'm a woman or because I don't have kids or because of this. It's like, no, this is just this own person, this other person's belief system. And I don't agree with it. So, you know, whatever. Okay, let me... Let me scroll up here. Or scroll down. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Yeah, that's that is a good example, Gareth. He says, kind of with embracing discomfort. He says, I have a bone and muscle disease and the exercises uh, and some of these exercises that I have to do hurt. I am told to do more of, of the ones that hurt. 
Yes. And, and this kind of goes back to that self-awareness too, of um, stepping outside of your comfort zone of, okay, the degree of discomfort, you know, if it's extreme, then we're overdoing it and it's going to have the, the opposite effect. Then we're going to be stuck in bed. It's going to take that much longer to heal because we're overdoing it. Um, it's, it's like after surgery or, you know, you break a bone or, or you go to, phys- you're in an accident, you have physical therapy, you know, they're going to get you up. They're going to get you moving around. It's uncomfortable and it can, it can really hurt, but it's like, okay, we've got, we can't lose this, this mobility. We've got to keep, keep this going. And, um, you know, but it, and that's the challenge. I think that's the challenge too, with emotional health is physical health, there's more, um, it's more concrete, you know, there's more parameters that we can look at. Okay. You were able to take five steps today and, um, only two steps the day before and zero steps two days before that. Like you can see concrete progress and you can see there's just a seer. It's, it's more, uh, um, quantitative. Is that the word I'm looking for? Like it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's more measurable and versus emotional health, which really varies from person to person significantly. And so it, and it it, it just creates a whole different set of challenges. Um, and it can be, yeah emotional health is it's just its own set of challenges. It would be great if there were ways to, to better uh, like quantify and qualify like treatment, like mental health treatment for certain, for certain things and in a more like systemized way but also being able to take into account the, the variability of each person and uh, to be in tune with that. Cause man, I tell you, it's so easy. It's so easy and it's awful. And it's the worst feeling ever to have good intentions and then to say something that comes across as a um, hurtful or triggering or re-victimizing to a person that you're trying to help. It's awful. And it hap- it happens. It happened tonight. Uh, there was a gal in the chat who was triggered by the conversation we were happen- having earlier with Jordan Peterson. And she's like, I've got to go. So, and I get it and I respect that, you know, but it's hard to, to hear that when you realize, oh my gosh, I totally crossed a line um, inadvertently with somebody. And that, that makes me sad, you know? And I know that that's, um, that's her stuff, but at the same time, I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm rambling, but it's, I think if they're, cause it is so easy to cross a line and inadvertently, um, kind of create these situations that lead a person to a funk or, uh, it's just, it's not helpful at minimum um, to be able to kind of factor that in to, to thinking about more effective treatment. So I don't know. I'm sorry. Thinking out loud here. Yeah. Kevin, I agree completely. He says, it's such a wonderful, mysterious thing, the process of re-self-actualizing following the abuse. Yes. Yes, I agree. Um, Kenneth is saying, I really wish emotional health was better understood by most people. It's complicated, but people who don't understand usually make no effort to understand. Yeah, and then the added challenge is people that 
uh, it's kind of like, like that, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's a Dunning-Kruger effect, but it's, a. Uh, um, I guess it would be the opposite of that. Like I, I have to, there's gotta be a term <laughs> for it, but I, I can't think of it right now. Um, where if you've studied something and you have advanced degrees in it, you think you do know what you're talking about. And it's very easy to, to fall into, well, I know what I'm talking about. So therefore, if this isn't working, then it's gotta be this other person's fault. And I see this with, with quite, with more than I'd like to admit, quite a few mental health professionals. And it's something that I really stay on guard with, with myself, because I've, I've been on the receiving end of this and it's absolutely maddening when, um, you know, there's such a, 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 a communication breakdown, um, where they're not realizing like, no, the, the issue here is communication. Um, you're not, like, you think you're familiar with this and this concept, but I can tell by your responses that you're not, but you're, you're kind of spinning it back on me and we're just not communicating at this point. So that's the added challenge of how do you get through to people who think that they do understand, but they actually don't. Yeah. Challenging. Yes, I agree, Renzo. I think that's great input. He says, I think... Um, you can help people individually by looking where they are at in, in terms of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, physiologically, safety, love, belonging, esteem, and self-actualization. Yep. I agree completely. I had a project that was due for a class. This was a while back and, um, it was, it was interesting so I had to, to write a pro to write this paper on um, kind of doing um, about a client. Okay. And anyway, I'm trying to think about how to say all this without like breaking confidentiality or anything. Um, kind of long story short. Okay. So this client had some very significant special needs, okay? And a very uh, limited ability to communicate effectively. And um, one of my biggest takeaways from that experience was exactly what you're saying with the Maslow's hierarchy of needs is if safety isn't there first, then it doesn't matter. Nothing else matters. Nothing's going to happen until that those safety needs are met. And that client who, you know, spoke, had very, very, very limited vocabulary. And um, this, I learned so much from that particular person, just based off of that, of the importance of safety and when somebody's going to open up and and explore parts of themselves it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what their their level of um understanding or um self-awareness or iq or uh, ability functioning or diagnosis none of that matters what matters is that ability to create that safe environment it it's that it's vital so I agree with you completely. Embers asks, Dana, question. I just started EMDR a few weeks ago. Is it less effective over video? That 
That is a great question. I think it'll depend on the person. So um, I think for quite a while, telehealth has had this, has been kind of seen as the, the redheaded stepchild of, of mental health and um, has definitely if even that, <laughs> like, that might even be putting it generously. Um, it's been really frowned upon and it's seen as, as kind of this, uh, you know, not the most ideal treatment that in, in person is significantly more ideal. What I have found personally and professionally is, it, well, it's interesting too, because now we're in a time of COVID where pretty much lots of people are going to telehealth type things is there's different degrees of, of safety and security that a person feels through video versus what they feel in person. And I have found that in, in through video and, or just messaging or turning off video and talking with the video off. So I will be curious to, to see kind of the research that comes out about that in time. I found that people tend to be more forthcoming and open when we're not sharing the same room. So that's very interesting to me. Um, with that said, EMDR, it's, I think it probably depend on the, each, an individual uh, response, but I don't see why it would necessarily be any less effective um, because you're doing a lot of the work. I mean, it's about eye, eye movements and it's about kind of reprocessing, reprocessing memories. It's about recalling things and then kind of uh, reconnecting them. So I don't know. I'll be curious to know different people's experiences with that. <laughs> Marie says, what the heck is telehealth? Uh, basically online, online, there's online counseling, there's online doctor's appointments, there's online, so many things online. Interesting. Embers is saying she, um, the gal she was doing with EMDR with was saying she can't do eye movements over video. Hmm. I haven't heard that. I know that there's quite a few practitioners that do. I'll have to ask around. I, that's the first I've heard that. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder why. Huh. Okay. Let's see. Let me scroll up here. Kenneth was saying, he says, I'm still feeling scared to open up about having depression and anxiety. Last time I did, I was told you have nothing to be depressed about. Well, that's really invalidating. That's terrible. and ridiculous. And I'm sorry that that happened to you. One of the things that can help with counseling, um, it goes, I guess it's kind of the ongoing theme of, of tonight's discussion in general is the importance of effective communication. And it truly is the core of any type of secure, um, functional relationship. And it's, I think, appropriate and necessary to have effective communication with your therapist, if you have a therapist. So, and that's it in the effective communication is a two-way street. So that would be something to 
kind of screen for when you're seeing, um, if you're looking around for a therapist of, okay, what kind of communication are we going to have? A lot of people, again, myself included for a long time, had this idea of, okay, well, they're the expert. So therefore I'm just going to let them lead the show and anything, uh, any concerns that I might have, any issues that I might have, any boundaries that I feel violated. These are just, it's just further examples of uh, work that I need to do instead of, and then it took me a long time to realize, you know what, maybe this therapist isn't a good fit for me, or maybe this therapist is actually a terrible human being who should not be a therapist at all. There's all kinds walking around out there. So having that understanding of, cause you're, it's your time and it's your money and it's your mental health. And so saying, okay, I, these are the issues that I want to work on. And I really am looking because it's a screening process because, you know, the therapist, just like any other professional out there, there's a wide range of difference. Um, and boundaries will be crossed and there, there will be times that they will probably say something that comes across the wrong way. It happens. It's going to happen when two people are, are being authentic. What matters is how, how is that, uh, when that line does get crossed, uh, I guess, what, to what degree and what frequency does that happen and how do they handle it? And are you able to bring it up? And are they able to be, um, how do they handle it? You know? Um, so yeah, that's, that's really what's important there. So letting them know, like, this is the kind of relationship that I'm looking for, where if something comes up or, um, you know, gosh, I'm telling you I'm depressed and you say, oh, you've got nothing to be depressed about. The, that really hurt. I felt very invalidated and that you're able to bring that up instead of, um, instead of holding that inside. So, and again, this stuff's not, every therapist is different and how to, how to like, quote unquote do therapy is going to be different from therapist to therapist. And, um, all of these understandings, you know, it helps to have th this kind of groundwork with them because some are, you know, they lead the show and this is, you know, you're just kind of along for the ride. And then there's others that have a more team oriented approach. And, um, you know, there's others that are, that hardly say a word and they just, they let you um, explore and process. So it's finding, kind of figuring out what's working for you and what's not. Okay, let me... Scroll up here. Um, okay, so Fatima was talking about to certain toxic people. She says, if you don't say anything to them, they'll walk all over you. Should I treat these people like I would normally treat narcissists? Should I set boundaries with them the same? Yeah, okay. So here, my take on it is your boundaries, um, we're, we're always setting boundaries with every single person that we come across. And so instead of thinking about boundaries in terms of, um, should I treat all narcissists this way or um, all toxic people this way? Thinking about, okay, what's, where is your boundary kind of from situation to situation? So, because um, each, each person, toxic or healthy, your, your boundaries, you're going to be continually adjusting them on the fly based on the situation, based on previous approaches, based on what's 
worked in the past based on what wasn't what hasn't worked in the past so I guess kind of knowing that that we're always setting boundaries with other people whether we realize it or not and that it's okay and appropriate to have boundaries with every single person in your life and that you're always going to be adjusting it so if you realize <clears throat> I guess the benefit to that is we don't have to to wait around to get the clarity of, oh, is this person a narcissist or gosh, are they toxic or are they just having a bad day? Or am I just having a bad day? Like it really doesn't matter. We don't need to, to figure all that out. What we need to figure out is, okay, how is this interaction is, how is this interaction going for you in this moment? You know, and then kind of responding accordingly. So let's say, for example, uh, if, I'm trying to think of, uh, let's just, well, let's just say, let's just say you're having a bad day. Okay. And, and you're like, okay, well, I'm not, I'm just really in a bad mood and I'm not sure you encounter this other person who's really kind of hostile or aggressive or rude or whatever. And you're like, well, I'm not sure if, is it me or them? Like, I know I'm having a bad day. Is their behavior, are they being rude or am I just interpreting it as it's rude? Like either way that how you handle things is going to be pretty much the same. You're going to get some distance. And maybe they're telling, they're teasing you in a way that wouldn't have bothered you any other time, but today it bothers you. That's okay. Because bound, boundaries are, they're flexible. They're not rigid. So there's going to be times where somebody interacts with you one way and totally fine. They might interact with you in th that same way another time, totally not okay. This is, this is why it's so important that we're, we're able to assert ourselves and adjust our behavior because boundaries are they're, they're always in flux and other people's boundaries are always in flux. It's not like we're just difficult, right? It's just, this is a thing. So, um, I don't know. Let's say you always, you're always lighthearted and chipper at work and your coworker, who's also normally lighthearted and chipper at work comes in and they're having a really awful day. And you can tell they're not responding to you in the same way. They're not being lighthearted and, and playful. We adjust to that, right? We're not going to just keep on doing that because obviously there's something going on with, with them. So it's kind of just adjusting our approach a little bit. Does that, does that make sense? Um, Let's see. Fatima says, well, what if you just have anxiety and you freeze? Should you walk away? Okay, so if you're at a place where somebody's behavior catches you so off guard, and again, we don't need to figure out what their intentions are. All you know is that you go into freeze mode and you're like, oh, you don't know what to say. You don't know what to do. You're just stunned. The, the first thing to do in that situation is to get out of freeze mode. So you're best off taking some time. So uh, excusing yourself, going to the bathroom. Um, if they're confronting you about something, uh, they're asking you to do something uh, to say, can I get back to you? I will well, not. Can I, I will, I need to get back to you about that. You're, you're bringing some space into that. So you're allowing yourself to not be so reactive. You're allowing yourself to, for your, your logic and critical thinking part of your brain to come back online to where you can actually become responsive instead of being reactive. So yes. And you can always, and most people do this, the vast majority of people do this. You don't need to handle every single issue that comes up right then and there. And you, you, you most likely won't. Um, sometimes 
things do catch us off guard. I'm also one of those people that when somebody does something that is just so out of left field, I also go into freeze mode. And that sucks. And I was so hard on myself for so long before I realized, I'm like, man, why didn't I handle that better? I cannot believe I just stood there or I didn't say anything or like I quote unquote allowed this to happen, not realizing, oh no, this is actually, it's a freeze response. And it's part of how our brain works. We don't get to decide if we go into fight, flight, or freeze. Our brain decides for us. So knowing how, what is your default uh, response to stress and then trying to work with that. Uh, Fatima says, well, I've had somebody confronting me to beat me up. Oh, this was a long time ago. Okay, good. Um, I'm glad this was a long time ago. What should I do? If so, if somebody's confronting, if they're threatening to beat you up and it's at school, I would tell a trusted adult. So if you have a teacher you like or a school counselor you trust or the principal that you trust, letting them know what's going on, uh, I think would be a good first step. And then kind of steering clear of that person as much as possible. You know, so they're looking, people that, you know, threaten be, to beat you up and all that, they're not looking to resolve the issue. They're not looking to be team oriented. They're looking to kind of strike fear and intimidation. Um, it's not mature behavior. It's not appropriate behavior. Um, you know, trying to be reasonable and rational with them tends to not work, especially when they've made it known, oh, hey, I'm so tough, I'm going to go beat this person up. Then they, they're kind of putting themselves in a position where they can't back down or else then they're seen as weak or they're all talk or especially at, you know, school environments. Because um, then there's peer pressure for them to to move forward on their threats. So, um you know, I would say just keep yourself, do what you need to do in order to keep yourself safe and let other people know and try to be in a group. And um, yeah, and I just, I don't know. I don't, I, I guess at this point in my life, I don't try to reason with unreasonable people. And that's to me is unreasonable behavior. So I just steer clear of it and take as many precautions as I can. And if I need, um, you know, if you have to defend yourself, you have to defend yourself. Okay, Mark, let me scroll up here because I missed part of what's going on. Cha cha cha. He says, Well, what if you have a narcissistic abuse coach that gaslights you? And when you bring it up to them, they deny it. Okay, I missed some part of this conversation. When uh, when you bring what up to them? Well, I guess I, I, I'm hoping that you're responding, but uh, if regardless of who it is, if you have a life coach or a therapist um, that you feel is, I guess it depends. Is it, does it, is it, 
like, what are they doing? You know, like, is it intentional and is it malicious or is it them not seeing things from your point of view or is, is what's going on? This, it all goes back to effective communication. And I, I just think the most important relationship a person has where it, it's not an important person relationship a person has, but one of the more significant relationships where effective communication is absolutely vital is with your therapist. So if that can't happen, then it's time to find another therapist. So they need to be able to have that open, honest, sincere, solutions-oriented communication and to be accountable and to be validating and to treat you with dignity and respect, especially when there's disagreements. If they're not able to do that, then there's no secure relationship possible with them. And it's going to, it's going to negatively impact um, your time together with them. So interesting. Mark says, okay, they tell me I'm feeling emotions that I'm not feeling. And they ended a session early because they needed to eat and then got mad when I confronted her about it. There's, okay, and again, I wasn't there. I don't know what happened. I will say that there is a technique called, um, and I don't know if this was even going on, but there's a technique that's called reflection of feelings. And it's basically when you have a client who's telling you this is kind of what's going on and, um, and you reflect back to them what you're hearing, what you think that they're feeling. And I've seen, I've seen two approaches with this. I've seen um, some mental health professionals will say, it seems to me, they won't, they'll say it in a more general way, which allows that person to either agree or disagree. So they'll say, wow, you, you um, it sounds like you feel really invalidated or um, that you're really struggling with some depression right now. But I've also heard others say, no, no, that's not empathy. It's only empathy if you're directly experiencing their emotion and reflecting it back. So then approaching a client and saying straight out, um, you, you're feeling invalidated. You're feeling depressed. And if that's true, then it can really resonate. Like, wow, yeah, this person really gets me. Like, yeah, I am really feeling invalidated. The downside to this is if it doesn't, if it's not accurate and that person isn't feeling that way, then it can be very confusing for the client. And the client might think they might be coming from a place of, well, and I'm not even saying this is what's going on, but I'm just bringing this up just in case it is, where if, if a therapist is labeling your emotions and they're saying, oh, okay, well, you're feeling very invalidated or you're feeling very sad. Um, and you're like, mm, but it can cause some doubt. Like, well, I don't know. Am I like, I don't think I'm sad. I think I'm mad or no, I don't feel invalidated. I feel um, um, frustrated or whatever it might be. So, but sometimes and this, this is one of the reasons I'm not a fan of, um, of that second approach, because I think there's a lot of times clients, it can cause a lot of confusion within them because like, oh, well, this professional is telling me that I'm feeling this way. So therefore I must be feeling this way. And they must somehow have this, you know, sixth sense on how I'm feeling, even though that's not how I'm feeling. So they must be reading more into my behavior than I realize. That could be one thing that's going on. Um, it could be, um, 
if it's not, I'm trying to think of some other situations where it could be, if they're saying, you know what, you seem really upset and you're like, no, I'm not upset. But then all of your body language, your, your facial expressions, all of this does not line up with that. And they're holding on to this. They're like, well, you know, your, your fists are clenched and you're talking through your teeth and you're getting kind of loud. Um, you're telling me you're not upset, but everything else is showing me that you are upset. It can help if it's, because some people can be very disconnected from their feelings. So they don't, how they think they feel and how they're expressing themselves are, are it's significantly different. That could be it as well, or it could be something just completely off base and your therapist is really misreading you. Um, let's see here. Elizabeth was saying, I understand that therapists or coaches should only use manipulation for positive goals, such as erasing false beliefs. Yes, I'm hesitant to use the word manipulation in that context you know, kind of the truest definition of the word manipulation means to change something from one thing to another, but it has this very negative connotation um, that changing one thing to another, it, it implies this level of, uh, you know, like deception or deceit. So that's why I'm not necessarily comfortable using, or yes, I guess using the word manipulation. Um, depending on the therapeutic approach involved. So let's say if we're talking about, let's, let's say cognitive behavioral therapy, right? And so there's this work, you're doing this work on examining a person's, um, you know, your, their thoughts, feelings, and actions, they all tie in together and examining a thought and then potentially working to reframe it. This is this is where this is why effective communication is so important because it is so easy for these things to go south, and for uh, communication to just go off the rails, and the client and or the practitioner is not even aware of it, and damage has been done. So, getting feedback uh, along the way is just it's vital. It's vital for this because this is so easy. It's so easy to do and it's so easy to have happen. Um, yeah. I'll give you an example. Um, and you guys have probably heard me say something like this often. So I was talking to somebody and they were telling me how stressed out they were and they had all this stuff going on in their life. And I had made the comment, oh, well, uh, you know, gosh, that's real. That's understandable that you're having a lot of anxiety and a lot of depression. You have a lot going on in your life. And I was, my intention was I'm trying to validate them. And I could tell by the expression on her face that she was interpreting it as I was saying, um, oh, it's totally normal. Therefore, it's not a problem right? Because it's a totally normal response. And so because thankfully her face was so expressive that I was able to pick that up. And so then I was able to add to it of just because you're having a normal reaction to an abnormal situation doesn't mean that this is somehow not a problem. Um, but it's important to kind of see like, oh, wow, my intention for this communication was to validate her and I completely in accidentally in ended up invalidating her. And so then when I realized that adjusting my approach and then further clarifying. So I guess what I'm saying is it's, e it's easy. It's easy to, for these things to kind of just go into a ditch. Um, and this is why it's so important to, to be open, um, 
to that communication and to be like, okay, is my intention, because communication, it's not just about intention, it's how it's being received. If it's not being received in the way that I'm intending, then some change needs to happen. So um, yeah, and these things can just go south any number of ways in a session. I just, I, 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 it's, it's difficult. Um, let's see, let me scroll up here. Yeah, Jack was saying, you know, maybe instead of manipulation, you could refer to it as like encouragement. Well, and here, and here's the thing too, with, with therapy is, um, I think, in my opinion, a good therapist is one who obviously has their client's best intention and at my, in mind at all times. But um, who isn't emotionally invested in the outcome, because then then you're just controlling the client. So. Uh, there's a lot of work that a mental health practitioner has to do in order to, to continually check in with themselves to make sure that, because we all, we have unresolved stuff too, that, I mean, it's just, it's a lifelong process. So you got to make sure, okay, where is this certain stuff coming from? Am I putting my stuff on the table or bringing my stuff into the room when I'm working with somebody or is it, um, you know, uh, I, the, the client, in my opinion, the client needs to have that autonomy at all times. That's for me, that's the goal for them to be able to live their, their highest and best life by becoming their highest and best self as they define it, not how I define it, you know, how they define it. So even if I don't agree with them, it doesn't, it, it's not my place because it's their life. They're the ones that have to live with their decisions at the end of the day. And it's not appropriate to kind of be playing puppeteer with another person and in, in their decisions. Um, and it can be easy to slip into that if we have our, if we're not aware of our own unresolved stuff um, or we're not checking in. So that's the thing the thing with like with the terminology manipulation or encouragement at the end of the day, um, I think transparency is really important. And so talking to the client about these things of um, like what you're, what you're doing, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if you're trying to, to change a thought, bringing that up, like, okay, well, what if we were, we could look at it this way, or we could look at it this way. Do you see what I'm saying? So that there's, they're open to possibility, but at the end of the day, they're still making the choice. Um, yeah. So. Jack is saying, oh, good Lord, YouTube. Why are you glitching so hard when I'm trying to watch? I think it's on my end. I had this weird issue notice error thing come up early on in the live stream and I don't know why it's frustrating so and I think I'm going to sign off here pretty soon guys I it's been a long day uh let's see here let me scroll up. Oh, and Jack was talking to Elizabeth about, oh, could you explain to me more about what you meant? I'm not totally certain on how manipulation for positive goals would work.
Okay. I'm talking about the different words and such. Yeah. I don't know. I just, I'm a big fan of transparency and the skills, the therapeutic skills and techniques. It's they're help. They're helpful. And, um, I guess I kind of come from the pro approach of it's teaching a person how to fish instead of then just giving them the fish or sliding the fish into their back pocket, <laughs> which can be like some therapy can kind of feel like that where you don't really know how you got what, where you, where you, where you got. Um, so yeah, teaching these skills, just being very transparent, it would be very, be very helpful. So just empowering. Oh, you know what, Kenneth? I think I did get it. He says, could I resend that email from last week to you? I'll have to check. I'm trying to, to get my inboxes all lined up. And I, I just realized now when I read your thing, I don't have that inbox synced up to my other email. So I apologize. Okay. That's, yeah, this was my attempt at trying to get organized. I created all of these different email accounts and then I was having them all connect. It just became very quickly became such a big tangled, awful, nightmarish mess. So ay, 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 that I'm trying to untangle and figure out. Yes, that's a good point, Elizabeth. I like that. She says, yeah. And when you think about it with the narcissist, they made you believe that you couldn't fish without them. And the therapist makes you believe that you can. And the therapist directs your train of thought. Yeah. I think a good therapist instills in a person that level of empowerment. And, and not necessarily makes you believe it or not even necessarily instills in a person, they help you to rediscover it because it's been there all along. It's just you needing to see that. That's the challenge. So, okay, guys, with that said, oh, excuse me, I think I am going to sign off. Um, I'm going to go to bed a little early tonight. So with that said, you guys, just lots of love to you. You are not alone. You are not crazy. And you really can move forward and heal from this. And um, I do think that at some point we should have a video topic about um, just some sort of more like directed approach to healing from narcissistic abuse and, and what that would look like. And I'll share my thoughts and ideas and um, we'll kind of go through it together. So, okay, guys, have a wonderful evening and a wonderful week and I will see you soon. Okay, good night. <laughs>